Hello and welcome back to Foreign Correspondents. I'm Sami Zorang and joining me here in the studio is our panel of foreign journalists. Welcome to the program. Thank you for being here. South Korea is at war with fine dust air pollution. The problem is more pronounced during the winter season, with the operation of heating devices creating a lot of particulate matter. So on this week's edition of Foreign Correspondence, the topic is fine dust, where we currently stand and what can be done to solve the issue. Fine dust refers to microscopic particles in the air, so small that they cannot be seen with the naked eye. South Korea's Environment Ministry has released a guideline informing the public of seven protective measures against fine dust. And efforts to avoid the hazards of fine dust has changed the daily lives of South Koreans. Ehun, what kind of protective measures do you take when there is a fine dust advisory or warning in place? Uh, so we have uh, a couple of uh, purifiers, air purifiers in the house. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have two kits. Uh, if the air is too bad, if it's over 50 or over 70, we, we don't let them outside, which is uh, a lot of days, actually. A lot of days mm -hmm. in the year, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is quite a shame, actually. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And what about you, Anne? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because I spend some time in New York and then the rest of my time in Seoul. And my life in New York and my life in Seoul are drastically different. Uh -huh. In New York, I never have to worry about this problem. And it's really a non-factor. It doesn't affect my daily routine. Mm -hmm. But here uh, in the morning, I check the air quality on the app. Um, if it's dangerously high, I stay inside. Mm -hmm. So it's, I guess that's all you can do, but um, you kind of feel like you're trapped. <laughs> right. Now let's move on to South Korea's response to this fine dust problem. On November 8, South Korea's government introduced new response measures to tackle fine dust air pollution, one such measure being the abolition of its clean diesel policies. Are there any policies in the Netherlands aimed at reducing the operation or the number of people buying diesel cars in order to reduce fine dust and air pollution? I mean, the, the, the fine dust levels uh, already uh, decreased and this is done by trying to solve congestions especially around the big cities and I think you can do that by taxing diesel cars more heavily than cars that run on uh, on gas mm -hmm. so I think the measures have been quite successful but I'm not saying that uh, we are there yet because if you look at the threshold that the uh, World Health Organization have set, the levels are still too high, also in the Netherlands. Ah, so above the threshold. Yeah. Um, are there subsidies given to people who are looking to purchase eco-friendly cars then? Uh, well, there used to be uh, subsidies on, on uh, people who wanted to buy an electric car. Mm -hmm. uh, there still is, but when the success of these electric cars is growing, and even some car companies already planning to only produce electric cars in a couple of years. I think the government is now thinking about uh, scaling that down because uh -huh. it's becoming too expensive. Now, staying with the topic of subsidies and diesel cars, in another effort to reduce the number of diesel cars on the road, the South Korean government is offering subsidies to diesel car owners turning in their vehicles for scrapping. And what else can the government do to discourage people from purchasing diesel cars? Um, taxes are really important. I think most economists agree that kind of a carrot and stick approach mm -hmm. is the way to go. So um, heavily taxing diesel fuel and then also, as we said, um, incentivizing uh, more fuel efficient cars by uh, offering huge subsidies for them. And is that the situation in the States right now? Um, well, we do have uh, some subsidies programs. The 70s, we had a huge smog problem in big cities like LA and New York. But with the Clean Air Act, we were able to clean up the air. And um, we had this landmark uh, Clean Air Act, which enforced uh, stricter regulations for vehicle emissions mm -hmm. and coal plant emissions right. and smog. Um, and so it helped tremendously. 
Um, and so now our air is among the cleanest in the world for mm -hmm. big cities. Right. Uh, however, right now with President Trump in office and the EPA being headed by a former coal lobbyist yeah. with the auto industry and their powerful lobbyists, mm -hmm. we are seeing some rollbacks. Right, seeing some backtracking mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Now looking at the origins of fine dust here in South Korea, many South Koreans believe that the origins of countries fine dust lie outside the country, especially China. Studies show that a large amount of air pollution and yellow dust do indeed flow in from China. In your view, how much of South Korea's fine dust originates from China? So, um, I mean, uh, to be honest, we don't know uh, for, for sure, but there's been a number of uh, uh, investigations uh, and some research is done, and I think they all center around between 34 and 50 percent of the fine dust pollution comes from China. So I think it would be safe to say that almost half of the pollution is due to China. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that Korea doesn't have its own problem. Right. Then do you think the criticism of South Korean public saying that China is to blame for the fine dust problem or the bulk of it is not justified? Well, I think it's definitely warranted to mm. at least for a certain part to blame China or at least hold them responsible, of course. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, half of the problem is still a very big part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's very important that uh, Korea uh, speaks to China about this. I mean, mm -hmm. they're working together about, uh, on this topic. I'm not sure what the concrete results will be, but at least they're talking. and. I think uh, hopefully China feels its responsibility as well because it's not uh, a problem that is just confined to their borders. It's mm -hmm. other countries, uh, also Japan, are, are, bo are bothered by this. So, right, uh, right. And it's, you know, it's uh, harming children and, mm -hmm. and, and people's lives. So I think it's, they should be held responsible in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, South Korean President Moon Jae-in, during a meeting with his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping and other high-level Chinese officials, raised the issue of China's partial responsibility in worsening Korea's fine dust air problem. And how do you think the two governments should work together to resolve this issue? Well, they have been apparently working together, um, apparently opened some sort of uh, environmental group, like a joint environmental center, and they're talking about doing joint environmental research, but they should be more specific about you know setting goals that can be measured because a lot of what governments are doing um, are just when the air levels or the air quality levels mm -hmm. are quite bad. So like the Korean government, Seoul government, uh, when the it's classified as dangerous or or high, um, then they do something. But they should be taking measures that are preventative and and you know making uh, strides all the time, not just when it's an emergency. Mm -hmm. Now let's move beyond South Korea and China because fine dust pollution isn't a problem limited to the two countries alone, but rather a much wider concern that stretches across the globe. You mentioned that fine dust problem is an issue in the Netherlands, right? What kind of measures are in place uh, by the government to reduce the fine dust pollution level? I mean, right now the fine dust levels are relatively low. I mean, they're, uh, so uh, an annual average of PM25 levels would be around 16 to 20, mm -hmm. which is relatively low, but it's still higher than the World Health Organization threshold, which mm -hmm. is about 10. Right. But the real problem in the Netherlands is in the areas where there's a lot of big farming, so where uh, farmers are pulling a massive amount of chickens and pigs and cows mm. for the meat export. Right. And there you see uh, much higher uh, uh, fine dust uh, uh, levels. And that's a problem for the, for the people living around those farms. Mm -hmm. So what they're trying to do is enforcing some measures to have farmers to have filters or mm -hmm try to see if those farms can decrease in size as well. Right, okay. Now in France there have been lawsuits um, against mm. the state as well for the fine dust issue, namely uh, the one recent one between a lady suing uh, the French government for, she says she's an alleged victim of mm. fine dust. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah, so she's a yoga teacher in oh. Paris who suffer from a, a lot of respiratory problems and mm -hmm. she sued the state saying like it's because of the pollution that she suffered from those problems. And what's interesting is that she's not the only one. 
uh, you see a lot of uh, people, not only in the big cities, but even in the countryside. There is a, a valley in the Alps named Valle de Larve. Basically, there is not enough ventilation, so the pollution stays, and people really, really suffer mm. from respiratory problems. So they sue the state to tackle the source of pollution. So we see all these uh, trials. I think so far, this uh, yoga teacher trial, I mean, it's still going on. There mm -hmm. is no, no judgment yet. But I think whether or not she will win, I think it, what matters is once again uh, increasing awareness mm. about the issue and putting some pressure on the state. So I think it's a good initiative. Mm -hmm. Now, on November 28th, the EU adopted a new resolution which aims to reduce the continent's carbon dioxide emissions by 45% by the year 2030. Do you think this pledge can be carried out quite smoothly? Well, not very smoothly. I mean, I think the promise is made, so that's a start, mm -hmm. but it's going to cost a lot of money. I mean, uh, if you start to tax people uh, and people feel it in their wallet, then uh, they might not disagree with your national policy. Uh, so it all comes down to how they want to realize this goal and, and you know, what people will think of that. Um, and also, if other countries uh, do enough because you can maybe fulfill your own goals right. as a EU but if the US is not participating <laughs> then you know what's the net effect of all your uh, your investments mm -hmm. it's a downer for a lot of people a lot of countries mm. because you can only do this if you do it together yeah. because uh, it, it really feels a little bit uh, you know, depressing you know if you spend a lot of money and do a lot of investments in trying to get your emissions down where the neighbor mm. uh, across the Atlantic is just going on and even increasing emissions. So uh, it feels uh, pointless in a way. And that's really the danger for the, the Paris Climate uh, Accord. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so uh, I hope that the next administration will uh, revise uh, its opinion and come. Com comes back to the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, the Paris Agreement, basically the, the target is to reduce, the, um, to keep the increase in temperature under two degrees uh, mm -hmm. to compared to the former uh, in pre-industrial level. It's not enough already. Yeah. Uh, there is many studies. Recently, I mean, in South Korea, there was uh, a report uh, of experts that was published and they, they showed that, uh, international experts, and they showed that ac actually you should keep it under 1.5 degree. That should be the real target if you want to reduce the impact. And the fact that the United States decided to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, I think this decision is uh, f folly. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, crazy and I think it will be harsh, very, very, it will be judged very harshly by future historians. Mm -hmm. It's really, mm -hmm. really, really bad decision. Yeah, by the future yeah. generation. Yeah. It, it's absolutely a shame that the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Agreement. Um, but even though President Trump uh, is opposed to it, there are a lot of individual states that are still committed to the agreement, mm -hmm. and also big corporations, um, American corporations that are committed. So, you know, hopefully um, some parts of the U.S. will continue to try to do their part. Mm -hmm. All right. For example, yeah, I heard like California, maybe California. I mean, did, uh, what can... Uh, what can they do? I mean, if their own government doesn't want to, to respect the Paris Agreement, do they still have some leeway, some...? Yeah, there are about, I think, maybe 20 states who have said that they're still committed to, oh. you know, trying to um, shoulder some of the burden that the rest of the, the Paris Agreement um, participants are trying to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And continuing on with measures by, adopted by other governments around the world to tackle the fine dust problem, could you tell us more about the tree Wi-Fi technology over in Netherlands? Well, I think we mentioned a few times that uh, it's very important to, to, to raise the awareness mm -hmm. of uh, fine dust as a problem. And uh, tree Wi-Fi <laughs> house in the Netherlands is one of those uh, 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 things that uh, is helping with awareness. Uh, it was founded in 2016 by uh, a guy in Amsterdam and he uh, so he basically installed uh, bird houses in streets and it would lit up if the finders level would go beyond a certain level. Okay. So it would show that the finders uh, is a problem in your own street. Right. Which is sometimes the case because because of the congestion in and around mm -hmm. cities uh, it, it can be a problem in certain neighborhoods. So it also showed that if uh, people would like not drive or you know would 
do stuff to uh, decrease the amount of fine dust, you know, whether that's possible, I don't know, but it, the light would go off and the Wi-Fi signal would be turned on automatically. So uh -huh. you would get free Wi-Fi because the fine dust level would go down. Uh -huh. So that was the principle. But of course, this was not widely introduced in the Netherlands, but it was a, I think it's a way, a funny way to raise awareness that fine dust could be a problem in your own street. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now, many countries are now switching over to renewable energy sources, partly because the burning of fossil fuel is seen as a major contributor of fine dust. What kind of government schemes are in place in the States to encourage citizens to adopt renewable energy? Yeah, the federal government in the United States offers subsidies for renewable energy sources. So homeowners who use like solar panels mm -hmm. or wind projects, um, they can deduct up to 30% of the cost from their taxes. Uh -huh. um, and then on top of that, individual states, like depending on where you live, they will offer additional incentives like uh, state tax credits or cash rebates. Sometimes the, the local utility company will buy the energy from you mm -hmm. because they're required to have a certain amount of renewable energy. Right. Do you think renewable energies are sufficient to meet all of our energy needs? Uh, at the moment, no. I mean, it, that's a fact. I mean, it's, uh, so if you look at wind energy and, and, and solar energy, it's part of the national uh, energy circles, but it's not enough. Uh, we have, for example, 10% of our energy household is uh, nuclear. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a lot of gas in the northern part of the Netherlands, which is used, but because there have been uh, some earthquakes in the region for a long time, we're, uh, we're gonna stop with that. Mm -hmm. And it's not clear what's going to be used in place of that. I mean, um, we import a lot of electricity from France, uh, from Russia, from Germany. Uh, and not all of that is, uh, of course, eco-friendly energy. So the question is, are we going to increase the eco-friendly energy means? And is it, will it be enough to, uh, to sustain the whole energy uh, demand? And, and I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coming back to South Korea, some critics have pointed out that South Korea has been forced to use more fossil fuel as a direct result of the Moon Jae-in government's nuclear-free policy. What are your thoughts on expanding the use of nuclear energy as a means to discourage the use of fossil fuel? It's a good question. I mean, I, I come from a country where uh, France relies heavily, heavily on nuclear energy. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't have the last figures, but I think it's close to 80% of energy comes from nuclear power plants. Of course, nuclear energy doesn't uh, emit uh, fine dust, mm -hmm. so it's in that sense cleaner than coal, but it doesn't mean it's clean either. Uh, you produce toxic material that you have to store for centuries. Yeah, nuclear waste. Nuclear waste, and that is a huge problem, and there is no guarantee at all that uh, the human civilization would be wise enough to be able to store this uh, very toxic waste for centuries. Right. Uh, as a journalist, I, I went to Fukushima after the disaster, mm -hmm. and I think that turned me into a pretty uh, anti-nuclear activist uh -huh. without even knowing it. Like when you, when you meet all these people who had to leave everything they have, who lost everything, and who life is ruined just because they live next to a nuclear power plant, uh, and you know another accident will happen. Like the question is not if another accident will happen, it's just more when right. and how. Mm -hmm. okay. So I do think renewable energy and uh, energy savings are the way to go. Uh, something interesting in Japan is after the Fukushima um, disaster, they decided to shut down all the nuclear power plants. And one of the solutions uh, they found out different ways to reduce their energy consumption. And mm -hmm. I think that's something that we should all do, uh, be more, uh, aware of uh, how to save energy. Mm -hmm. And that probably applies regardless of fine dust exactly. problems, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's move on to the topic of advanced nations' responsibility in fine dust. As we mentioned earlier, although South Korea is trying to find ways to tackle the fine dust pollution problem, it is also true that a portion of its pollutants is carried over from China. 
In turn, some experts claim that heavy air pollution in China has been caused by its import of waste from other countries across the world. Then, do you believe that the U.S. and European exports of waste to China is causing heavier air problem, air pollution problem in that country and vis-à-vis -vis in South Korea as well? Yes, maybe. Uh, the problem is still world worldwide, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, finders pollution is never limited, as we know, to a certain country. So, I mean, it, you know, for the worldwide problem, it doesn't really matter where you burn your garbage or where you try to process your garbage. But of course, uh, I think the question behind this is, you know, do developed countries have a more responsibility in solving this problem than maybe developing countries? Because most, more, a lot of richer countries are, are you know, shipping their garbage yeah. to mm. developing China. countries, mm -hmm. yeah, to uh, have it processed there. And I, but I think already in the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, it, and, and other environmental agreements before that, it was agreed to that uh, richer countries do more and mm. pay more than developing countries. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting question, but it's also a question that's already been raised, I think, in, in the several uh, environmental agreements mm -hmm. that, that have been made. So mm. do you agree that it has been sufficiently addressed by, for example, the Paris Climate Accord? Oh, no, I mean, I don't think it will be sufficiently addressed, but at least uh, it has been addressed mm -hmm. and there is a discussion, uh, but it's, it's never sufficient, mm -hmm. obviously. Okay, mm. not sufficient enough <laughs> at all. Okay, now, despite concerns over fine dust, many lesser developed countries are still forced to rely on fossil fuels due to technological limitations and cost constraints. So, given this reality, do you think the world's more advanced nations are unfairly placing the burden on developing countries to reduce their consumption of fossil fuel and reduce their production of air pollutants? It's a tricky question because, uh, you know, the developed world, the reason why we are industrialized and prosperous is because we have used fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a real link between fossil fuels and economic growth. Right. So to ask the developing world not to use that same thing um, is, is kind of hard, but at the same time, uh, we could do more to help them, um, which would be like actually financing their adaptation to other types of energy. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. And mm. if I had something, if, if I can add something, uh, I think anyway, developing countries, they have their, their own interest too in having mm. uh, to reduce pollution. I mean, yeah. when uh, it's a public health issue, and for example, in China, I heard like many like the richer people, they want to leave uh, China because of the pollution. They want to live in other countries. So you have a brain drain issue. Like mm -hmm. anyway, each yeah. country they have their own interest mm -hmm. in keeping their in reducing the um, air pollution. And on top of the brain drain, um, it affects their GDP mm -hmm. um, because climate change disproportionately impacts uh, the global south. Because right. any increase in temperature, where it's already mm -hmm. hot, has a bigger impact. Right. Absolutely. So this is my final question. What can the international community as a whole do to keep the fine dust levels down worldwide? Yeah, well, I think the, the, what a lot of uh, developed countries, uh, European countries already did, I mean, we had a big fine dust problem mm -hmm. in the 70s and in the 80s, and I think in the US as well. And we got it down by, you know, having less diesel cars, uh, improving congestion, which, you know, if you look at Seoul, is, uh, is a way to go as well. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of congestion here, and, and that's probably also a big factor in, in Find Us. So I think the message is it can be done if you, if you want it to, to improve. So, um, you know, don't hold back and, and, and get a plan to really, really improve the situation uh, uh, for your own citizens. For, uh, it's a health issue, it's not uh, only an economic issue. Mm -hmm. If I can play devil's advocate, I mean, isn't it, didn't in Europe we manage to reduce air pollution just because we exported many factories and uh, like polluting industries to China, for example? Uh, I, I come from a city that used to be very polluted because there was coal and there was a lot of industry. So now it's clean, but it's clean just basically because the industries went to other countries. Uh, so I think there is as well an effort to be done in terms of uh, maybe R&D, research and development to come up with a cleaner industry and not only 
just export our factories in developing countries where the, then they, they will have to take the burden of pollution because mm -hmm. it seems to me that this is what EU, uh, European countries did in, in some ways. They just shifted the cloud of pollution to another part of the world. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your so. insight. The Director General of the World Health Organization had this warning to share in a press statement released back in October. No one, rich or poor, can escape air pollution. It is a silent public health emergency. Fine dust is no longer a problem affecting just a few countries, but rather a global issue that requires urgent international cooperation. That's all we have for this week. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye.